Afternoon, everyone. Thanks again for joining us here. Um, we'll get started and introduce our guests uh, right away and get going on this thing. But uh, just a couple quick housekeeping things before we do get going. Uh, once again, um, if there are any questions, we will have a Q&A period at the end. So please put them in the question box and we'll sort through those and hopefully get to um, any questions you guys have. Um, and just before we introduce the guests here, uh, this is obviously our last session uh, and our fifth and final session. And I just wanted to say thank you to everyone who's turned out to these sessions. Uh, when we were putting these together, we weren't really sure how they were going to go over, to be honest, whether we would have five people, 20 people, 100 people. And uh, I think we've averaged around 150, 140 um, logins every single time. So um, without you guys coming on, it wouldn't be much fun. So Thank you to you guys for uh, making this a success and uh, hopefully everyone could, can learn something or has learned something throughout the process. And uh, moving on to our topic this week of on ice development and training. Uh, I've got great news for everyone on the call. And the first piece of that good news is you guys don't have to listen to me talk too much this week if you're sick of hearing me talk. Um, and the even better news is that we have three really, really great knowledgeable guest speakers on. Um, all these guys are really knowledgeable in, in, in hockey. They have different experiences in hockey. Um, they've coached in hockey, they've played hockey and uh, really happy to have all three of them on today. So just a quick introduction of all three of our guests before we get into our actual talk here. But uh, first guest is Topher Scott. Many of you guys probably know him best from his Hockey Think Tank podcast where he's the co-host and creator of, uh, but Topher, played NCAA hockey at Cornell, uh, which uh, we won't talk about the rivalry between my school and his school, but um, had a successful uh, uh, stint at Cornell, played three years of minor pro in the East Coast League and CHL, and then went on to coach in the NCAA um, for a while back at Cornell, and now he's back coaching minor hockey in New York State. So Topher, welcome on. Uh, our second guest is John Goins. Um, once again, we've got um, podcast royalty on, on the show today. So, um, he's also started a podcast, co-host of the Hockey Masterclass podcast. And John coached uh, many years at Lac St. Louis Midget AAA program, which is a high-end uh, minor hockey program in, in Quebec. And then went on to be, uh, become the head coach of Bicomo in the QMJHL last season. Um, and like I said, he is the current co-host of Hockey Masterclass podcast and also started a thing called Coaches Cafe, which some people are familiar with, where it brought together a number of high-end coaches from all over the world, basically, in all different levels and leagues um, to help share ideas and, and just kind of talk about the game, which was uh, really cool. And I was fortunate to be a part of those calls, some of them. So thanks for joining us, John. Our third and final guest is Brandon Narado. Uh, Brandon played hockey at Michigan University, uh, went on to play a couple years pro in the East Coast League and CHL, uh, worked with Total Package Hockey in the Michigan area. Um, he has been the skills coach for a little bit for Saginaw, which we, again, we won't talk about um, too much, uh, and currently is the skills and a player development consultant with the Detroit Red Wings and uh, trains a lot of high-end, uh, really talented NHL players and, and, and young hockey players. So like I said, three great guests and we'll jump right into it right away. Um, talking about our on-ice development here. Topher, um, I, I recently listened to your podcast, uh, a couple of the episodes, and one of the things you mentioned, one of them was talking about playing with your head up and one of your coaches, I think it was the head coach at Cornell, talking about why he loved the player because he played with his head up. And then I think in one of your more recent ones too, you talked about the importance of passing. And I think you're watching a game with someone and he was talking about, you know, watch when there's three passes made, um, how often that results in a scoring chance or, you know, how little three passes in a row are made. And I think when we talk about on ice skills and development, oftentimes, we want the fancy kind of sexy stuff, but these are really fundamental principles. And can you just talk about the importance of like fundamentals, especially for young hockey players? Yeah. I mean, fundamentals are, are everything and being able to execute skills like, you know, skating, shooting, passing, 
and, and all that is extremely important. And I think the one that gets talked about the least and probably developed the least is passing. And at the end of the day, hockey is a team game. It's, it's not an individual game. And if you sit down and, and I had the opportunity, just like Mike and, and a lot of other people like to, to watch a lot of minor hockey, watch a lot of youth hockey. And I always kind of felt that the team that passed the puck the best usually won the game. <laughs> and, it's, and it's such a, such an interesting fundamental skill. And, and just those stories that you referenced, you know, we go back throughout our careers and things that we've seen in our experiences that really kind of stick with us. And one of them was just like you're talking about my head coach, uh, Mike Schaefer that I played for and coached with at Cornell uh, when I was recruiting, you know, as a recruiter, it was a really big learning um, experience for me because we went to go watch the USA select 16, 17 festivals to do some recruiting. And, and there was this one kid we went to go see. His name was Alex Green. And Alex was a kid who was kind of skilled, but not overly skilled. You know, if you put him on Instagram, if you put him, you know, out there with people of his age, he'd probably be average, maybe a little bit above average when it came to the, to the shooting, to the skating and, and the puck handling type stuff. But Shafe was like, man, this kid plays with his head up. I want him. That's all he said. Plays with his head up. I want him. And so as assistant coaches, we were like, all right, our boss wants this kid. We got to go get him. And we were kind of like, okay, like he's, he's okay. But the, the boss wanted him. So we were like, all right. And so we ended up uh, taking him. Um, and he just, his development went just like that because his hockey sense was off the charts. And he ended up becoming a uh, fourth round draft pick to Tampa Bay, just signed uh, his, his deal uh, after his junior year at Cornell to, to be a part of the Lightning organization. And it's just a really interesting, again, learning for me coming up through it, recruiting, like just how important to our head coach who's been doing it forever and his coach players that have gone on to play at the highest levels, how important that just playing up with his head up was and being able to, to pass the puck and get it to the forwards and, and all that. So it was, it was just a really, really cool thing. And, and at the end of the day, like, you know, we all talk about hockey IQ. We all talk about hockey sense. And, and for me, passing is the thing that really exemplifies that when we come to player identification and we, and even when it comes to player development and because passing, you have to have the hockey sense to get to support areas to be able to get the puck. And also you have to be able to, when, you know, you're, you're cornered off and maybe the defender's pressuring you, you got to be able to find a way to get the puck to somebody else. And, um, you know, it's one of the things in hockey development, I think is getting lost a little bit with how much, um, if, if you go on social media or if you go to watch skills coaches, a lot of times there's very little passing, I feel like. And, and I feel like, you know, I think as coaches, we need to do a better job of really implementing those things into our, not just our practices, but into our individual skill sessions as well. Um, and I think we'll be able to build um, a lot, you know, smarter hockey players, the more we focus on the passing aspect of it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a great point. And I think, like you said, that's stuff that you have to practice. And that's, you know, playing with your head up isn't something you just do. And you're, you know, you're doing these skill sessions like this, you know, every time you're on the ice and all of a sudden the game starts and, you know, your head's up. So it's an important thing to remember when you guys are training, are you training the right way? Are you doing the things that are going to transfer over to the games? And we'll talk a little bit about that more later, hopefully. But um, moving on to John real quick. Um, you've coached a ton in minor hockey at a really high level of minor hockey and you've come across a ton of different players, um, a ton of different parents, and you've seen a lot of things done properly and you've probably seen a lot of things done improperly. Is there any advice you could give to minor hockey parents of any level um, just from your experience at the minor hockey level do's and don'ts and, and maybe more on the don't side even? Well, well, first of all, I'll actually uh, piggyback on, on Topher's uh, point here about just the fact that it is a team game. And the, so we all talk about individual development. And that's great, you know, because I think for a player, any player that's, that's on today feels really good about being a team player when they feel good about their skills, right? Their ability to handle a puck, pass the puck, shoot the puck, skating, all that stuff. It's tough to have that strong amount of confidence in yourself to be a team player if you don't have those basic skills. 
But in what coach Topher Scott's talking about here is we all learn from a young age, cooperation. So as much as we can work on our individual skills and be strong individually, if we do not learn to cooperate and move that puck, think about any time any of you have ever watched the soccer game and how big a pitch is. There is not one soccer player that ever goes from one goal line to the other. There are some unbelievable rushes, unbelievable plays once in a while from a Lionel Messi or Ronaldo or whatever, and they'll be on SportsCenter. But the reality is the most basic concepts of sharing that puck, cooperating, is so overlooked. And it's very unfortunate. And the reality is, again, just like shooting, you got to work all aspects of your passing because the game is imperfect. There is no perfect game. So you're going to get a bad pass, practice catching it on your skate blade. You're going to practice catching it on your back end. You're going to practice catching it on, you know, with one hand on your stick. And that's going to lead into to my question about like these do's and don'ts and, you know, maybe some mistakes and stuff like that is that we always look for this like activity, like all this activity, but there's no productivity. And so for the younger kids, that means like you could run around and run around, but if there's no true, uh, if, if we're not working on stuff that you as players can bring to the game, then we as coaches are hurting your ability to feel really confident about yourself when it comes to the team game. And so my message for parents is that as much as we want individual development and we want to hire development coaches, um, what I always encourage when I'm hired is that you should have two to three other players come along with you because the sport is about cooperating. It's about collaborating. So for example, we could work on all the skills we want. We could go through cones. We could deke stuff, all that stuff. But eventually now we've got to add pressure or we've got to add a pass option. And so going back to what Coach McKenzie even said about hockey sense and awareness and all that type of stuff is if you only ever work by yourself, it's very hard to recognize when do I give it? How do I get open? Oh my Lord, I've got pressure coming. How do I protect it? Because listen, I work with cones and I'm not going to, I'm not going to ever say don't practice with cones or don't practice with this or whatever. But what I am saying is at some point we have to add pressure and we have to get Johnny, Hillary to work together. If not, when you show up for your team practice or your team game, your collaboration won't exist. And so my, my point to the parents is as much as we want our kids to get better on an individual basis, we need them to get better at collaborating and the collaborating will also be how much I put pressure on somebody else that makes them better at protecting the puck, that makes them better at moving the puck, that makes them better a better teammate. And then when we go on to play, we feel like a, a, a true team. And so don't always just run away from opportunities to work with other players, because I think long-term that will actually benefit your son or daughter exponentially than just treating them purely like an individual in a team sport. Yeah. Yeah. The, the word you kept saying there was pressure too. And so I'm going to jump off the script already. Um, I was going to try to stay on this thing as long as we could, but we're already off the rails. And this one's probably for Brandon, because I know we've talked about this, even with our team, when we had you on for a zoom call with our team to talk about skills and, different ways to implement them into games. But John talked a lot about pressure and working with other guys and having people there. I know that's something that you're big on and believe in. And, and I'm the same way as hockey is a game of patterns and it's also a game of extreme variance as well. So and what I mean by that is when a defenseman goes back for a puck to break out that puck, they're gonna do that over and over, you know, a number of times throughout a game or throughout a season, but 
the situation that they're going to go back to is going to be completely different each time, whether it's one four checker, two four checkers, where the four checker stick is, do they have a D to D option? Do they have a middle option? You know, what angle are they coming in? Is the puck moving? All these different things create extreme variance um, within these patterns. So how do you train that? Um, and just to build on John's point, when you're working with your guys, how do you, how does that look for young hockey players to train that pressure, to train that variance and not just like you said, just be kind of a robot and go through those patterns over and over again. Well, what we start with is we start with the basic. Like we start with literally, it could be a stick handling drill. It could be like you're talking about recovering pucks. What the other, I guess the other, because this will stick with the same idea. We got to stop looking at development coaches that are creating robots because there are patterns in the game, but no one person can really dictate 60 minutes of pattern to a T because the variance, like you say, the things change. Someone falls down. Someone has a bad line change. Some, someone's left-handed instead of being right-handed. You, you have to make a pass sometimes where you have to look over your shoulder. Sometimes you're not going to have time to turn around or do a spin or sometimes you might not be able to get behind the net. And so, you have to create layers. So for example, we'll do a drill where a defenseman's on the blue line, sprint to the red line, and there's three forwards on the red line. And someone puts it behind the defenseman and one forward has to pressure that defenseman. Not allowed to steal his pass options. And that, so that defenseman has to work on making a play with his or her back to the majority of the ice and protect the puck and sometimes maybe lift that four checker stick or whatever. And so you add elements. So you might say pressure 50%. You might say, go all out. You might, you know, you might go deeper in the zone. You might put it in the neutral zone. It's about creating situations that replicate what happens in the game without trying to say, I'm going to dict as a skills coach, I'm going to dictate a hundred percent of the script, which is impossible to do. So let's get our athletes to a point where when they step on the ice, they are used to seeing something come at them fast. Like when we're driving a car, something comes at them fast and they've got to be able to make a decision based on their training. Yeah. Brandon, how does that look for your guys when you train them? Like, how do you implement that pressure? Like for a young, like a, like young minor hockey players, how can they do that? So to me, the first thing you do, like to go off Tove's point, I'll kind of try and blend all this together. Like you can't do anything without your head up. So John just made a comment. Like I give the analogy of driving a car all the time. When you switch lanes, what do you do? You know, you check your, you check your rear view mirror, you check your side mirrors, you take a look over your shoulder to see that no one's there. Nowadays you look to see if the, the lights flashing on your, on your side mirrors or you get the rumble under your seat. But if nobody's there, you move over, right? It'd be insanity to just move over and hope right? Just like a player under pressure with the puck that the next guy's going to be there, then you're going to get in a car wreck, right? So everything needs to be seen. To John's point, again, if I'm driving my car and I'm just going to read and react, imagine closing your eyes for 10 seconds, opening them, and then trying to react right away. No matter how skilled of a driver or hockey player you are, you can't process that decision because you're not looking at all the things that, that happen first. So what I would do with players is the first thing we do is just build up the patterns so getting off the wall would be a major concept, whether it's on exits or ozone play to, to create the space if I have it. So once I get off the wall, I'm in the middle of the ice, I can go straight left or right. If I stay on the wall, say I'm on the right wall, I can only go left, it limits my options, right? So how do you get off the wall? We blend skills together. You can cross over, you can use your edges, you can skate in a straight line off the wall, whatever. But then where's the pressure? Is the pressure within one stick length, which means you need to get into puck protection mode? Is it two plus, which means now you're probably manipulating somebody that's five to 10 feet in front of you, right? And then where is it coming from? Front, side, or behind? Behind as I'm coming through the neutral zone, maybe a tracker on me. Front as I'm coming through the neutral zone, maybe a tracker on me that's, that's got more speed or a defenseman skating backwards. So skills from a skill development standpoint, these are just options of what's in your, your, your toolbox and then what you would use to manipulate that pressure. But it's all feel with the puck. 
And then without the puck, it's the same rules that we've been living with with 50 years. If I've got a guy right on my back, F2, F3, D1, D2, whoever the closest guy, he's got to come and support me. I need help. If I've got time and space, then that middle driver or dot lane wide guy off the rush, now they've got to run their routes to get open to get the next play. But back to Topher's original question, passing is massive, but how do we work on it? How do we come up with these solutions? It's not just giving and receive or just making a pass. The biggest thing is, is what you see before you touch the puck, how you put your body in a position on first touch to get it to your forehand, your backhand, whatever it may be to make the next play. And to John's point, they're not always good passes. So can you take it from your backhand to your forehand and, and make the next play? Can you take it from your stick to your skate? Can you protect it while you're doing it? Um, but everything I do, I think that's how you learn is, is putting guys under pressure and then you just build it up from technical, tactical to transferable, which would just be a live drill or game um, where you're building up the skills that you worked on as options and, and giving them their reads when they're feeling the pressure. And going back to that ba bad pass analogy, I actually saw Brandon working with the Detroit Red Wings at the Bell Center where <clears throat> too often, and this isn't just for minor hockey kids, this goes all the way up to the pro levels. When, when players are working with each other on one timers or whatever, when the pass isn't good enough, nah, do it over. And I was watching Brandon work, I believe it was with Rasmussen and maybe even a D-man where they had their stick way up here, like for a one T and he purposely made them a pass on the opposite side of their body. So they had to adjust everything, catch it, Right. And that was the first part. And then the second part was what you did after you caught the puck. And so that's also the other aspect of layering these types of concepts, because as we all love the game and to the, to us, the game is perfect in that way, but we love the fact that it is imperfect, bad passes, bad shots, bad changes, bad. But the thing is, is if we only focus on the bad, then we don't come back to the rink and I just wanted to jump on that because I still remember uh, that particular point in a morning skate uh, watching Brandon work. I'll jump in real quick too. This is a little bit more for the minor hockey coaches. Like <laughs> I coach a youth team right now and they will literally contort their entire body like this way or that way or whatever to not catch a puck on their backhand. Like they don't want to do it. <laughs> like we'll be doing sequences and practice and doing some drills where it's just like an easy through the middle. It should be an easy, you know, to the, to the back end, but they will mess up the entire drill to make sure they turn their body a different way. So like we got to make sure as coaches, like catching a puck and making a pass on your backhand, like th that's a fundamental skill, Mike, like you were talking about that again, the kids, they just don't want to fail. They don't want to fail. And, and it's a little bit more difficult to catch a puck on your back end. So it goes to a couple of things. One is we got to make sure we're correcting that. And, but we also have to create an environment where the kids feel like, they, like it's okay to mess up and not catch it on your back. And eventually you'll get there. And um, just kind of going along with what you guys were talking about. I just wanted to add that real quick. Cause it is funny. Like I laugh with my assistant coach watching you know, 17 year old kids doing everything in their power to not catch a pass on their backhand so they can catch it on their forehand. I don't know if you guys see that too. That's probably a good point, Tof, just for coaches <laughs> in general is like, don't, don't restrict players. Like I've had college players hear it from college coaches and youth players that they can't make plays on their backhand. Like that's insanity. Or don't ever rim a puck on an exit if you're a defenseman. Well, if there's no clean play, like the, the game's actually played along the wall. Like that's one of the most underrated skills going is, you know, how a puck bounces off the wall or taking a puck off the wall and, th and then doing that under pressure to make the next play with your head up. But I, I wouldn't restrict players, just let them know the highest percentage option um, and don't be result driven at the youth level, more about the process with, you know, them getting those touches and feeling comfortable because that's where the technical side of development comes in is, Johnny, stop making pass on your backhand. You can't, you can't do it. Like you're way better on your forehand. Well, let's work on Johnny's backhand passing and receiving, and then he'll be better at it. And it gives him more options to have success because sometimes there's only options there and it's not the one that you want or it's your strength. So how do you get it to a position of strength or how do you use the other parts? Uh, because that's all, that's the only option you have. And that's one of Sidney Crosby's biggest strengths, right? So it's yeah. like, 
we're talking one of the best in the world for the last 10 to 12 years here, 13, 14 years already. And, you know, we talk about the Pavel Datsuks and we see highlights now of the KHL of even him shooting off his back end. So I agree with you guys. These, I think that would also be a certain uh, warning sign of a certain development coach that comes up with these, these absolutes that says never pass in the middle, never pass on the back end. Like, as we all know, unfortunately, there's too many minor hockey coaches that are, are, are very focused on systems and systems for me are for robots. And so you have nine year old kids playing uh, one, two, two trap. So right away, your option isn't even there available on the wall. Well, well, you got to learn to pass to the middle, whether it's in regrouping situations, breakout situations, pressure, no pressure. Um, you know, these, these are, not absolutes let's let's get away from those absolutes and people getting up on their soap boxes and again embrace the the failing of like Topher said of getting a bad pass or even falling down and just go at it again that's that's the fun thing about this is that you just get to do it over and over and over again because at the end of the day what you are practicing is approximately only five percent of your game but at a young age, you need to practice it that much more, just like we do with languages. And because at the NHL level, a Matt Barzell, for example, had the puck on his stick more than any forward in the NHL last year. So he had the puck on his stick approximately 10% of all ice time. Thomas Shabbat was the most for any defenseman, approximately 10%. So 90% of the game is played without. So average player is maybe 5% and, and it goes down. So work on all these things. Cause if you only work on the easy stuff, only forehand passes, then what's going to happen in that short window that you have to actually play with the puck, you're not going to be ready. Yeah. That was going to be my next point is that I think all you guys just there mentioned the word failing or failure um, or some form of it. And I think it was Topher that mentioned the coach is creating the environment where it's okay to fail and that's a huge piece of the puzzle. And so if the coach is creating the environment, can you guys talk about, I mean, you kind of already have, but we see it even with our guys that are older, they don't enjoy doing the stuff that they're not good at because they may look silly doing it. Um, it doesn't feel comfortable. Um, their teammates laugh at them because they can't do that drill or whatever. And I think a lot of kids struggle with that is that when they can't do something, um, especially some kids that have been really good players the whole way up, and then all of a sudden they get to a drill or a sequence in a drill where maybe they're not so good at it and everyone's kind of looking at them, you know, funny. And having that mentality where practice is the time or skill sessions is the time when you should be trying new things, when you should be out of your comfort zone, when you should be doing stuff that is extremely uncomfortable because that means that there's progression and that you are improving. Um, have you guys seen that with any of your young guys, like that kind of fear of, of, of getting to that line of, of being uncomfortable and getting into that area of uncomfortableness, I guess. I, I think that's normal for adults, for young kids. I, I think that's a great skill to overcome that, I'm dealing with it with my six year old right now. Like he loves doing things that he's great at. And then he struggles with things that he's not great at. I, I think it's human nature. Um, so I think that character trait, if you can add that into not as a hockey player, but as a human being um, that I'm going to try things out and give it a chance and, and listen to hopefully good communication or direction from whoever's teaching you. That's a great quality to have. You're just getting better. That's growth mindset. Yeah, I'll, I'll take it a step further too. I think the easy thing is allowing kids to make mistakes in practice or in skill sessions. The tougher thing for coaches is allowing it to happen in the game. And, and, you know, I, I've talked to a lot of different coaches who struggle with that because we are, we all have egos. We are all judged by wins and losses, whether it's the parents or the organization or, or whatever. So we, we can create this environment in practice where you're allowing kids to fail. And kids like all of us, like we just want approval. 
That's what we seek. You go get into psychology, like kids, people, we just, we're seeking approval. And as the coach of these kids, they're all seeking our approval. So we have to create that environment again, where we're approving of them to make mistakes because it makes them feel a little bit better. But if we just take what we do in practice and then we forget about all that stuff. And then when they continue to make the mistakes in the game, and then we get on them, it, you're not going to see that, that kind of development. So um, I would encourage all of the youth coaches and, and all coaches, I think, um, with a development aspect to your game, like you have to allow kids to make mistakes in the games too. Um, and, and then take that. If you're big on video, have them see it, say, Hey, look, we could have maybe done this better involve them in the process. Um, don't just be like a dictator from above and be like, Hey, this, 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 we got to do, you got to do this, this, and this involve them in it too. And I think you can see you'll create that environment a lot more, um, by doing that. Well, this is like any any of the kids that are on this or even any of the parents that are on this, just remember back to when any teaching your kids to ride a bike at the beginning. I'll be honest right now, my four-year-old wants nothing to do with it because he's not good at it right away. So he takes the balance bike and he wants to chuck it down the street, you know? And so this is where as a parent, we've got to be patient with that as well. <laughs> and we have to understand that at certain patients, but Topher makes a great point. It, you know, we can we can say that we accept it in practice. If we don't accept it in games, then, then it's being a very big hypocrite. And, and so for, for other analogies, it's like, I think it just goes into how do we emphasize post game or post practice with, with the players? It should be about, we got better today. Forget, forget the score, forget the score. It's let's talk about the attitude we played with, the effort we played with. Did we compete? Did we have fun? Like, let's, let's be honest, like right through to pro hockey, when it stops being fun for guys, you could tell when it starts going the other way and, and they're out of the game pretty quickly, but we're starting to do too often. That's happening to you kids. And this is, this is why I wanted to jump on here because this is all about leaving the game in a better place because it shouldn't be about that. It should be who cares when, when you're our age, who cares what the score was on a Saturday in November 20 years ago? Nobody's going to care, but everybody's going to see that you improved, your team improved, and you're going to make mistakes. I think it's as we get the kids a little older towards midget AAA, like with, with our organization when I was there for 10 years, our only thing was mistakes happen but mistakes without effort, that's what we didn't really tolerate because we didn't want to tolerate laziness or not, you know, no effort or, or, you know, not being a team player and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, guys made mistakes. We had a defenseman virtually score a goal in his own net at the national championships in the Tallis Cup. Did he play the rest of the game? Absolutely, because he was a defenseman that helped us get to the Tallis Cup. And he played the rest of the tournament. And that's what it's all about. Like, I think Topher, you nailed it. Like, if we're going to have it in practice, have it in games. I just don't want to hear coaches go, I can't keep toe dragging at the blue line. He turned it over. Little, little Joey is nine years old. Toe drag to death and help them be a better toe dragger. Help them be more efficient in that skill set. Don't just cut them off and tell them no, no, no. Yeah, yeah give them I'm a better switch solution. Gears a little bit here, um, but there's so much out there now with social media and stuff on Twitter, Instagram, uh, in general. Like you could go on there, especially in some of the bigger, you know, centers in you know Toronto or wherever, and you could find a hundred different people that do skills, uh, power skating, whatever, shooting instructors. They're all over the place, and the the uh, you know hockey minor hockey and minor hockey training has for better or worse um, become a, a business for a lot of people uh, which is fine but it comes with some pitfalls and, and sometimes there are things you want to avoid or things that don't work for for you as an individual if you're a young hockey player so like what are your guys thoughts on finding the right fit in terms of someone that's going to make you a better hockey player, you know, with on ice instruction 
And are there any things to be cautious of when you're looking at, you know, getting involved with a hockey school or a camp or a skills coach or any things that stand out that you can give a little hint that, you know, this person knows what they're doing, they're doing the right things uh, in your guys' experience, um, you know, and, and what you guys have done and seen? I'll, I'll start with that one. My thoughts would be find the best people. Like if you had, uh, I'll just give a random analogy, but a guy that played a thousand games in the NHL, played 20 years, that doesn't mean he's a good coach. Like even the best X's and O's coach, whatever that means at the youth level, like is that better uh, tomorrow or 20 years from now from the guy that is a third grade school teacher that played baseball growing up, never played hockey, but he extracts information from the kids. He gives them a voice. He brings positive energy every day. He allows them to fail forward. He's prepared and has a plan. And it's more about overall development in life than it is about winning the next game. Um, th to me, that's the win. So it, it's, it's like my kid's six. I don't know if he's going to play hockey. And then I've worked with everyone from, you know, that age to pros. It's just about putting them in the right environment. So that might be a skill coach or a coach in general. But be around people that are great communicators, bring ash energy and passion, and th and that care about your kid. And, and I think the problem isn't the X and O's or the drills or skill guys that do that are great with development. And there's guys that they really don't know what they're talking about, but they're good people, and and the kids enjoy it and they have fun with it. I I'd rather be with that guy than th the problem with the wrong skill coaches or coaches in general are the ones that use players, youth players to leverage either their own agenda or you've got to skate with the skills guy if you want to make this team or you've got to skate in the spring if you want to make this team. At the end of the day, when the fall season starts, like you're either good enough or you're not. W what you did is on you. Whether you put your gear away for three months and that was your plan or you skated six days a week, whatever makes you happy and a better person and, and you have the right mental well-being, then – then that's a win. And if you're lucky enough to play at a higher level, then good for you. But um, not every kid's playing hockey to play in the NHL. It's more about, um, you know, all the metaphors that go with it, the relationships and failing, succeeding, meeting great people. Um, so I think that's what it should be about. And any skill coach or anyone that thinks they've got the secret sauce or they're reinventing the wheel from youth hockey to the NHL, the game's the game. Um, and, and I would just say make it fun from pros to, to, to mini mites. That'd be my big thing. Yeah. And I think just adding our onto what you were saying, like I think about the people that I want to be around and I want to be around people that love what they do. And, yeah. and I think that translates. And if you're around people that love what they do, it's a lot easier for you to love what you do. And, and we've talked about it a lot. Like one of the most important parts of development, if that's what we're talking about is passion development. Like if I can get this kid to love the game more then the kid is going to want to work at it more. And when they want to work at it more, they're going to get better. And so I agree, like the X's and O's, like you can watch a skill skate uh, with somebody, whether it's an individual or practice and kind of have a pretty good idea if this person uh, knows what they're talking about. Um, but are they energetic? Are they smiling? Do they give feedback? Like those are the kinds of things I do like, do they love what they do? Because that will rub off on, uh, on the people that they're teaching. Yeah, again, these are all great points. I mean, again, uh, just because you have a, a, a fantastic hockey DB doesn't necessarily qualify you to be that next skills coach or the next coach. That's reality and, and vice versa. And, um, you know, there's some former pro, former players that are fantastic coaches, you know, but typically they're the ones that have gone back to grassroots and learned from others. And I, I think things to watch out for is, avoid the fluff and avoid skill and development coaches that even though you're paying them to, you know, elevate your game, you still want them to have an element of accountability. You know, like if you're like, at the end of the day, this game must remain fun, but I believe strongly to get the most fun out of this game that we have to put the word fun and the concept of working hard together. And that it's not just about fooling around, fooling around to most hockey players, you know, that's outdoor hockey and that's great. And if that's how you want to, 
play hockey for the rest of life and, and you become a single letter player your whole life, I guarantee you, you'll probably play until your sixties and your seventies. And that's awesome. That's a different journey, but there's always, it doesn't matter if you're a single letter player, a triple a player, a pro player, when you can bring the two together, your, how you play, how you perform and how you'll feel about yourself when you come to the game will grow exponentially. And, and I think it's an important aspect of a skills coach's job is that they have to tell you when you're not working hard enough, I think. And, and to Brandon's point also, like these guarantees, oh, you worked with me, I guarantee you make the AAA team. I guarantee you, you get a full scholarship. I guarantee you're getting drafted. That's not your job. You're not writing anybody's story. Let them write their own story. Let them be inspired by what you do in how, what you talk about, how you push them, how you bring them along to <coughs> enjoy this game. Cause joy, if without joy, don't do it, but to enjoy working hard so that they can improve on a daily basis, but let's avoid that fluff and lack of accountability and accountability doesn't again mean screaming and breaking a hockey stick and all that type of stuff. It's just as a parent, we have to do it all the time. When our sons or daughters aren't doing certain things, there are moments where we have to hold them accountable. And it's not an ugly word. It's an important word and an important concept. Yeah. Part two of that question kind of, and you guys touched on it a little bit, but, and I don't want to get Brandon too fired <laughs> up here, but is fancier always better? Or, and I guess what I'm trying to say is if it's, if you come across something on Instagram and there's stuff on the ice and there's cool things on the ice and there's all these props and different elements, is that good? Does it matter? Is it bad? Like, cause we see it a lot now with different skills instructors doing kind of, I guess you could call it outside the box or, or different things. And does that stuff matter or is a basic, sheet of ice with a, a good person that knows what they're doing and all the things you guys mentioned about being a good skills instructor or coach is that just as good or better thoughts on that does anyone have any thoughts on that because we see that a lot now i think and it's an important piece to point out i, th I think that's great like that's not great but I, so jack rosovic did made a move the other day and a kid on my or a guy on my kids mini my team sent it to me and it was he put it through his legs and then went down and scored i told you might have posted about it It was an unreal move that was the right time to make that move right that same move made at the wrong time could lead to that player being out for 20 games with a major injury right so it all comes back to pressure and cones and other training aids don't give pressure. That doesn't mean that cones and training aids are wrong. It's a different type of training, probably the first step. And then you can do the same thing with a player standing there and putting out his stick and cutting off his arms or cutting back because the pressure's in front, whatever it may be. I think you can be more creative with it. Sometimes you need those training aids because you're the only guy on the ice and you're running 30 kids through a session. You can't spend the individual time with those kids so it helps keep them moving right but there's a time and place for everything it's not that it's right or wrong I think the more beneficial stuff is done with pressure but for younger kids it's it's good but it's it's all about the timing of don't teach kids moves teach them movements meaning if I've got the same movement and I'm attacking Topher there's three options I can use off of it versus just this one move and then if it's there, it works. If it's not there, it doesn't work. But that Rosovic goal was unreal, and and he just reacted quickly and did what he needed to do to create the space and go in and score. But that move's working, I don't know, five out of 100 maybe. And I think the D coach on that team that he beat is probably more upset with the defender than the offensive move. Like, that can't happen from a defensive standpoint. So – I could go on a rant on this. I'll stop now, but uh, it, it's, it's all about just do everything with a purpose um, and, a, and a plan. Yeah. You said do it with a purpose and plan. That was one of my questions actually that I was going to touch on. So any one of you guys can take this one, but 
oftentimes you see a kid or kids, a group of kids, you know, they have 10 minutes before practice. They have 10, 15 minutes after practice, just free ice. And they're kind of out there and they're just kind of, you know, messing around and, you know, flipping pucks around and, and stuff like that. And that's fine. Like John said, if you just want to go out and have fun and that's your, your sole purpose of, of why you play hockey and you don't really care that much about getting better then then great, go out and have fun. But if you're a younger player and you want to get better, you know, those 10 or 15 minutes before or after practice can really add up if you're doing something with a purpose or some form of intentional practice. And you're not always going to have a coach or a skills coach sitting right beside you telling you what to do. Is there stuff that you guys would recommend for guys to focus on or any like drills where it's like you have five minutes before practice, you got a couple of your teammates on the ice, no coaches are out there yet or after practice areas to focus on drills to focus on stuff that they can practice with purpose um, just for those quick little bursts of without coaches on the ice where they're just kind of on their own. What age group are you talking more older? Any, 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 any age. I mean, well, I think I go back. Hockey, but... Okay. So like, I mean, again, to finish off, uh, everything has to have a purpose and the, the Instagram skills can get scary. Now that's not to say that, if you see certain skills or something that looks like an absolute circus trick, you, you don't have to, you could like it. it. It could be cool, but it goes back to how often did that, did those things actually happen in the game? They're so minute. It could be probably, it's probably less than 1%. And so that's an aspect of the fun part. You know, the exciting part is that we get all these clips so quickly now and, and it's, it's fun for kids to enjoy that, but we, but the kids have to understand that a lot of times it's going to be stuff that's not cool to put on Instagram to work on. And, and I go back to imperfect and I go back to a little bit of stuff from what I saw with Brandon and, and I saw in Syracuse and I, I try to work with players a lot and players can do this in a group of three, four, five players is set yourself up like you're going to receive a pass to shoot and the player giving you a pass gives you a bad pass like gives you a bad pass. So you're here and you want the pass here in the middle and it's too much in front of you. So now you got to catch it on the backhand, pull it to the forehand shot. You know, for example, it's too far behind your feet. So you're here, you catch it behind your feet, you push it out, shot. So you, and then you replicate things. And then, and then you can add another player like, like uh, Brandon mentioned earlier. Now I'm getting the bad pass and the second player is just going to come and, approach me a little bit so now I got to make a, a move for example because protecting the puck is the majority of what we're doing with the puck before we shoot or pass or collecting loose pucks and stuff like that so I think working in in a very you could do this in a very small space you could be shooting on the boards you could be shooting on the net but work on shooting off of bad passes Hey, another thing, Mike, uh, just real quick. Um, this is something that we implemented um, at Cornell. So I work primarily with the forwards and at the end of all of our practice, you know, when you do your breakdown and say go red or whatever everybody does, um, we had, we called it a five minute club. And so we broke the forwards up into three different groups, an edge group, a shooting group and a puck handling group. And every day there was a specific skill in those three skills that we would work on. And it was player driven and they would run it. Um, and it was just what we're talking about right now. It's just that little bit extra, right? And part of it was to work on the skill, but part of it was like a mindset of like, hey, we're doing a little bit extra than everybody else. And it was just five minutes, but five minutes every day, you know, when you're doing that rep upon rep, that adds up a lot over a season and you're going to get half a percent better every day or whatever with the 15 to 20 reps that you're doing. Um, and it was just, uh, it, we felt like it was a, a really kind of cool, neat little thing. And again, it was just five minutes because the guys do at the end of practice want to play rebound or, you know, they want to do some fun puck, you know, puck protection, whatever type stuff, um, you know, one-on-one -on -one type stuff too. Um, but it was just like a little kind of thing that we did that I think added up over time. And <clears throat> excuse me, I uh, just a kind of, we took it from, I can't remember who it was, but it was, he was an assistant coach with Buffalo Sabres at the time we went to an NHL, um, the NHL um, coaches presentation thing that they do at the draft every year. And uh, we felt like it was pretty beneficial. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really cool idea. We talked about in one of our previous uh, webinars about 1% and, 
marginal gains and things like that. So that, that falls right in line with that. And it actually reminded me of a story about myself. Um, I had a coach when I was playing the East Coast League, and this is really similar to what Topher just talked about. But at the end of every practice, he would grab me and we would do basically it was like three to four minutes and it was five pucks. He'd give me backdoor pass, standing still, um, five pucks that way, five pucks on the other side, and then five pucks back coming down the back door, moving on that side, five pucks down the other side. It took literally two to three minutes to do. And at the time I was like, you know, this isn't really doing that much. Um, like I just shot 20 pucks, but um, we did it after every practice. I eventually got called up to the American League and there was a situation in, in the game at one point, one of the games where the puck came across the exact same way he would pass me the puck. And it was so ingrained in my memory and, and muscle memory that to get that pass on that angle, because I had done it hundreds of times at that point, that it just, it was automatic. And I ended up scoring my first Ameri American League goal that way. And I remember getting back to the bench and thinking like, was blacked out like I didn't even know what I did like memory and instinct took over so much from building that and ingraining that that process that it just became automatic so I think that's a really important point and even if it's 5 10 15 20 pucks or shots that all adds up and you do it every practice it can really make an impact and making things automatic when you're on the ice where it's not even you're not even thinking about it you're just subconsciously letting your instinct take over. And that's, I think, really important when we're talking about hockey and how fast of a pace the game is and things like that. So um, just before we get you guys out of here. Um, Actually, Mike, I just wanted to jump on one thing just because I, I'd be remiss if I forgot because you just nailed it. I think that would be an important aspect of looking for really good development coaches is development coaches that bring players to a point where they play with their instincts. That, that right there kind of encapsulates, I think, everything that we're talking about because we're avoiding robots and all that type of stuff. I think when players end up playing more and more with the instincts, doesn't matter what a coach's X's and O's are and all that type of stuff, when he or she are literally on their toes and playing with their instincts, there is a, 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 a level of thinking. Let's think about our iPhones, our, our laptops. It's the processor, right? And so if those development coaches can get those processors as fast as possible to develop poise playing the fastest game on two feet, players are going to play with their instincts and they're going to enjoy the game so much more. Yeah, for sure. And like I said, um, we're coming up on an hour here, so we'll, we'll get one more. We did have one question come in and I had it on my sheet anyway to ask. So we'll kind of kill two birds with one stone here, but you guys have all worked with pretty high end players at some point in your careers. What, I mean, we've talked about playing with your head up. We've talked about passing. We've talked about all these different skills. Is there one thing that stands out? Like, like whether it's shooting, skating stride that I got, like someone could, should focus on. I know it's the total package that's important, but is there one thing that you guys would pinpoint and say like, Hey, like that's, that's important for a high end player or someone that wants to move up in hockey. Um, I, I could, I'll start maybe here. Uh, I would say yes. And it's probably different for every player. I think um, I, I loved it. Like Alex Ovechkin, right? He's one of the best shooters in the world. Like that's what I noticed that sticks out to me is he's, he's an unbelievable shooter and gets the spots like Connor McDavid. His is, is skating. So like, for me, it, it's more about the best version of that player and what they can leverage, like talking about working on players' strengths and not just their weaknesses. Um, like, I, I just think it's different for, for everybody. That's what sticks out for me. And if, if we're talking about like a scouting, recruiting kind of thing, I would say just overall understanding of the game. But um, I think it's different for everybody. I would say uh... – the biggest thing is, is doing everything with your head up. That's everything. Every pro that I, that, that I work and not every pro does it, but like the most elite guys, it's just natural that everything's with their head up. And then the, the special all-stars high-end guys in the NHL, like the, the biggest thing I would say to young kids is learn how to learn. And some kids are 
fortunate enough to have great teachers or coaches as they grow up that teach them how to learn because they are great communicators to the kids. But it's not because Zach Warinsky or Kyle Connor already have a great shot or great skaters or this or that. Like they understand how to learn. So when I say something to them, I look really good because they pick it up quick and hopefully I'm giving them the right language, but it's because they ask the right questions on how to get it inside of their brain to absorb the information. If that makes sense. Um, that's the biggest thing. And even like, like Zach, I talk about it too much, but like he does everything slow when you're introducing new things because he wants to get the feel of his body and then merge his brain and his decision-making into it. But like, they're not worried about failing. Like they're doing everything slow and then they pick it up, pick it up, pick it up. But these guys, their ability to process info and, and learn and ask the right questions, that's the biggest thing for me. And, and they're tough nuts to crack at, at certain times because they're going to challenge you. So one more thing, this is going back to before. What's the biggest thing or the most important thing taken away from a skills coach or a coach is a guy that can fix you, a coach that has the details. You could take uh, an NHL team, the top team in the league, you could take their full tech packet, take all their video, all their drills, and run it with a 16U team or another pro team. You, if you don't know the details inside of that and then all the identity stuff that comes with it, you don't have a chance. You're just copy and pasting. And it's the same thing with skills, guys. All this stuff on Instagram, whether it's good, bad, whatever, if I gave you my whole hard drive, they're, the drills are so basic there's two lines you pass it across to the guy he shoots but to john's point we're working on a lefty on his off wing catching a pass on his backhand so the, the 10 year old team can do that drill by themselves but the great skill coach or coach can tell you how to kill that puck on your inside foot to then push it off and land on your left leg as a lefty properly like he can fix you versus just getting the reps i'm a bad golfer if I drive a ball 10,000 times, I don't know if my drive's getting better unless I'm doing it the right way. Where some guy might walk by me at the range and be like, hey, you got to lift your left elbow. That's why you're slicing the ball. Oh, man, I just, I just wasted two months of hitting golf balls, and that's all I needed. So knowing what to look for as a coach, as a skills coach, and then being able to fix it, but more importantly, communicate that to the player so that they can take it with them when you're not around. I think that's that's gold. That's everything. That's that's development. Let's just point out that there was another Michigan Wolverine plug there for Kyle Connor and Moransky. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> let's just put it out there. Um, yeah. At the end of the day, like it's 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 always tough to say one thing. I think that's that's what happens with these answers, right? We we all feel like it's tough to say one thing, but at the end of the day, as much as the game has evolved, it all comes down to skating, shooting, and passing. Like, right? Those are the basic give or take three categories. And, but within all that, it's what we've talked about. We've talked about, you know, we've talked about failing. We've talked about all that stuff, but everybody is so focused on Instagram skills. Well, everybody seems to be so focused on statistics. And so the reason I brought it up earlier is to bring that emphasis to young kids all the way up. If the reality is you are going to play a game and have the puck on your stick less than probably 5% of the game, well, guess what? If you want to play in the fun zone, you got to compete. It's got to be fun to compete when you don't have the puck. So when you hear coaches talk about a kid got recruited or drafted because of character, it's because most of the times they're hearing from the younger coach that he or she works in practice, competes in practice, competes when they fail, competes when he or she falls down. You are not going to have the puck that often. So what you do without the puck is not always about the perfect angling or the perfect stick check or the per. Probably 90% of that comes down to just wanting that puck back. Think about, think about anything we play, whether it's street hockey, a pickup football game on, you know, anywhere, on a pitch, on a field, anywhere, whatever made up sport. When you don't have the ball, the puck, that object, you want it back. Be hungry to compete to get the puck back. Yeah. 
Um, this has been awesome, guys. I really appreciate you guys taking the time. Uh, it's been a lot of fun for me. I'm sure it's been fun for you guys, but I think it's been extremely informative for, for all our participants today. So thanks again, guys, for coming out, taking your time to do this. Um, and just a reminder to everyone who didn't get a chance or wants to go back and watch any of these webinars, all of them are posted on the Kitchener Rangers YouTube page. You can access those there. Um, so feel free to check those out if you did miss one. And thank you again for everyone who participated. Um, this has been a lot of fun uh, for me personally, and hopefully we can help some people along the way, or we have helped some people along the way. And good luck to all you young minor hockey players out there. Thanks again, everyone. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, guys.